Is irrationality truly damaging to welfare and well-being? If we look at the negative consequence of irrationality, the answer is yes. A lot of social problems are actually caused by people's irrationality. Take overconsumption as an example. Some people eat too much, drink too much, they buy too much, or they smoke despite the risk of cancer and heart disease. Most of the time, people know exactly that they should stop these behaviors. They may even set New Year resolutions such as eat less, exercise more, spend less, save more, quit smoking, because they know that these are the right things to do. But when they attempt it, they don't use reasoning to guide their behavior. Instead, they give in to the temptations. This results in regrettable behaviors. For example, people who overspend may not be able to save enough for retirement, and people who over it suffer from health problems. So, irrationality often results in two things. First, poor decisions, which are often associated with negative consequences such as health problems, a lower quality of life, or financial problems. Second, irrational behaviors result in negative emotional feelings such as regret or general unhappiness. From this angle, I think irrationality can indeed damage welfare and well-being. We of course do not expect human beings to be totally rational all the time, but if people can be a little more rational, use reason more adequately in decision making, their welfare can often be improved a lot. Saving for retirement and leading a healthy lifestyle are some of the most crucial things adults need to do. Yet, more than half of US workers, for example, have no retirement plan at all, and even those who do have one typically don't have enough money to retire comfortably. According to the Employee Benefit Research Institute, actually the average balance in America's 401k accounts is just over 60000 and I think it's very obvious that this is very little money. Now you can say it doesn't matter what the average is, the most important thing is that those that are close to retirement age that they have enough money. But even if we look at only people within a 10 year span of retirement, it turns out that on average the savings amount to about $80,000. So people do not have enough money. They save too little. Why is that the case? The financial crisis is partly to blame. That's no, that, there's no question. But the larger truth is that we do a poor job of anticipating the future, saving and investing money. And I want to argue this is because of we are irrational. One big problem, for example, is loss aversion. Because we react to losses so much stronger than we react to gains, we tend to overinvest in government bonds, which return much less than stocks, something that you might have called, you might have heard of, it's called the equity key and premium puzzle. And because of loss aversion, we also tend to make the mistakes of holding on to stocks that are in their losses, in their loss for too long, and we're selling gains too early. Um, well, I can also give you some examples from the health domain. One of the big problems that Western societies face is an obesity epidemic. We know that eating too much sugar is bad. We know that if we have too many calories, it will show. We know exercising is good. And if we are being asked, we all want to lead a healthy lifestyle. We all want to eat well. We all want to exercise in the future. But then in the here and now, we make these seemingly weird decisions that harm our best interest. The main point that I want to make here is there's no question. Irrationality is truly damaging to welfare. I think in behavioral economics we often use that word irrationality and when we use it we're making a very big mistake. Irrationality suggests at its very root that people are doing something stupid. If you call the friend irrational, they're probably not going to be your friend for very long. It's not a very complimentary word. But that's not what we mean when we use that word irrationality in behavioral economics. We don't mean someone is doing something stupid. Actually, we use that word for technical, historical reasons, because somebody wrote down some axioms that they called rational. And as a result, when people violated those axioms, we called them irrational. But that word irrational doesn't in any way, shape, or form mean that the person is being stupid. I'll give you an example. If somebody underweights base rates in forming probability estimates, we would call them irrational in the technical sense. 
but it's foolish to call them irrational in the colloquial sense because what does it even mean to get base rates correct? The mind is configured the way the mind is configured. If I were to use a physical analogy, we wouldn't say, aha, human perfection would be to run the mile at three minutes and we are all somehow deeply disfigured physical creatures because we can't run as fast as a cheetah. That's stupid. We would marvel at someone running the mile at four minutes and 30 seconds. That would be amazing. And so the first thing I just want to start by saying is the human mind is amazing and it does what it does. The fact that it has these quirks, the fact that it has these mistakes, doesn't mean it's in any way wrong or irrational. It's the consequence of the mind operating the way it does. So once we think of it that way, then we can ask the question, are the quirks of the human mind, can they ever be damaging to our welfare? The answer is, of course. Of course we can make mistakes that lead us to be worse off. Think of the most trivial thing. You are walking out the door and you forget your keys and you lock yourself out. Is that damaging to your welfare? Of course, you're much worse off. Now, that by itself is not enough because we could say, is that mistake predictable? Well, yeah, the mistake is predictable. Look at your own behavior, think about it, and ask yourself, what are the times I'm gonna make that mistake? Obviously, when I'm rushed, I'm gonna make that mistake. So you already see in yourself that there are times, predictably, on average, when you're gonna do something that is worse than your welfare, that, that, makes, that, is worse, uh, that makes your welfare worse, so that you're making a mistake that then leads you to something bad. Now, if we were to put in an intervention in place, for example, if you were to say, I'm gonna put my keys right next to the door so I can't forget them, that's an intervention you've done on yourself that leads this behavior, this mistake to be less likely, that's improved your own welfare. I think a lot of social policy that tries to fix, quote, irrationality is nothing more than that. It's simply finding those situations where predictably we make mistakes that we ourselves would agree we're worse off for it, and we then design solutions to that. And I think all the heat in this debate is just generated because we use the word irrational. Well, is irrationality really damaging? Well, it depends on how we define rationality. Um, there are at least two different definitions. One is really the decision academic definition. Um, it's about um, internal consistency, about, for example, uh, compliance with uh, a number of axioms, such as um, transitivity and so on and so forth. In that sense, um, lack of rationality may not be that damaging. Um, it may be damaging, may not be damaging. But on the other hand, um, there's this substantive sense of rationality. That is, lack of rationality means failure to maximize what one wants to maximize. So, for example, if we pursue happiness, but if we make decisions that fails to maximize happiness when we can, then by definition, it lowers one's um, welfare. And um, I think we should uh, focus more on the second type of irrationality. That's a great question, I think. Um, no, I don't think it's truly damaging, because if you look at the literature, oftentimes how people study irrationality is to create these sort of um, somewhat artificial, I would say, uh, scenarios or context, and then people uh, are not making the perfect irrational decisions. But the tendency of not making the right decisions in these contexts, that, that's a little different from the typical environment in which we make decisions. I mean, many of these sort of heuristics and biases are actually quite functional um, for our mental system. You know, our mental system evolved uh, to be functional. Uh, it survived and developed these tendencies. So in actually a lot of the naturalistic settings, uh, they proved really useful. Now, I also find it interesting, you know, uh, the term welfare, because it almost seems like uh, people can only be um, doing well if they make the right decisions. Now, right decisions meaning rational, perfectly following self-interest and so on. Uh, but I don't really think that that's how well, well-being or welfare should be defined anyway. It's a subjective sense of happiness. After all, we want to be happy people, you know, we make more money. So what? We want to be using the money to gain happiness down the road. I mean, that's the ultimate goal. And if people are being irrational, but that makes them more happy. I don't see any real problem with that. Hi there, I'm Shankar Vedantam. I'm the author of The Hidden Brain, a book about unconscious bias in everyday life. I'm going to be making the case 
that non-rational or irrational thinking is not at all damaging for human welfare. In fact, it might be extremely beneficial. Let me give you a little bit of background. In the last 10 or 20 years, there have been literally thousands of studies published that suggest, in ways big and small, human beings act in irrational or non-rational ways. So, for example, I might pay somebody $20 to mow my lawn, because that's how much I think mowing a lawn is worth. On the other hand, if my neighbor were to knock on my door one evening and hand me a $100 bill and say, please mow my lawn, I would probably tell him to take a hike. It doesn't make sense at the level of rational behavior, though. Let me give you another example. I was recently in um, South Africa, and we went to a very nice restaurant, and at the end of the meal, I paid an 18% tip at the restaurant. Now, this is a restaurant I'm probably never going to go to again in my life. The restaurant staff are complete strangers. I'm probably never going to meet any of them again in my life. I have nothing further to expect from them in terms of anything they can do for me and no particular reason to want to build goodwill among them. So why did I leave the tip? It didn't really make sense to leave the tip, did it? Given that I can expect nothing rational in return afterwards. Let me give you one final concrete example of non-rational thinking at work before I make the case on why such thinking might actually be very good for us. I don't have flashy multimedia graphics here, but I want you to try and imagine that there was flashback music playing right now. Do 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 do. Let me give you an example of non-rational thinking at work. I'm on a plane right now, flying from Washington to California, and there are lots of studies that say that flying is the safest way to travel. But just a second ago, the captain came on and told us that we're going to be flying through a lot of turbulence, told us we had to fasten our seatbelts. We might be able to see some of it in the background. And now my mind starts to think, how far down is it to the earth? I look out the window. This is what I see. There's the earth, all the way down there. And I start to wonder, if I fell out, down over the Rocky Mountains, how long would it take me to hit the Earth? One, two, three, four seconds, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so that didn't really make a lot of sense. Turbulence really shouldn't make us as afraid as it does. When was the last time you heard about an airplane crashing because of turbulence? But I want to make the case that the irrational fear that I had on board that plane was actually a very good thing. The irrational fears that many of us have about airline travel have led to policies and procedures that have made aviation as safe as it is today. Without those fears, aviation would probably be much more risky than it is today. It's because so many of us are afraid about airplane hijackings and terrorism that we have security policies now that have made airplane travel so much safer. When you think about non-rational thinking across the board, there's two ways to think about it. You can think about the thinking and say, that's crazy, that doesn't make sense. Or you can ask yourself, why is it that our brains have such a great propensity to think in non-rational or irrational ways? Why do we have non-rational thinking in our brains? Now, unless you're somebody who believes in intelligent design, the reason our brains work the way they do is because they have been designed by evolution to work the way that they do. There's a reason we have non-rational thinking in our heads, and that's because over the long term, thousands of years, millions of years, non-rational thinking, the biases that are built into the brain, have protected us. They've allowed us to survive and arrive safely to be who we are today. So when you think about these biases, you can think about them in two ways. If you want to think about them like an engineer, you would say, that's a terribly designed system. Why is the system so dumb? Or if you think about them like an economist, you would say, look, it makes no sense that you would pay somebody $20 to mow your lawn, but you wouldn't take $100 from your neighbor to mow his lawn. Or 
it really makes no sense that you would leave an 18% tip at a restaurant that you're never going to go back to ever again. So if you think about those things in a very narrow fashion and you want to mock those kinds of behaviors, you should probably become an engineer or an economist. On the other hand, if you take the long view and can see how these kinds of behaviors can promote human welfare over the long term, because otherwise we wouldn't have those behaviors at all, welcome to being human. Dilip's first question to me was whether irrationality necessarily damages human welfare. It's a very good question. I have a pretty simple answer, to be absolutely honest. Uh, the answer is no, not necessarily. And I'd also say that the obverse may also be uh, interesting, which is that rationality or attempts at being rational may sometimes damage human welfare. Let me explain. Economists, to a great extent, have hijacked the word rationality to mean in accordance with economic theory. So, for as long as economic theory is a perfect guide to how one should behave in human life, then it's fair to say that rationality, which has obvious sort of positive connotations, just as irrationality is basically a fancy Dan word for stupid, has obvious negative connotations. Um, now, rationality is pretty good for as long as economic theory coheres well with what's a good decision. But it's worth remembering that the whole business of economic theory is really a contrivance. It's designed for a species that doesn't really exist um, and in circumstances that never really pertain on planet Earth. So there we have a little bit of a problem. Now, here's a good example. We have an inbuilt bias, if you want to call it a bias. I wouldn't call it a bias, but you can if you must, to see sticks as snakes. If we have something in the corner of eye which might be a stick or might be a snake, we tend to react as if it's a snake, disproportionately so. Well, I say disproportionately, but if you think about it in evolutionary terms, it's much better for our brain to actually be somewhere on the side of, to err on the side of caution. If you make the wrong mistake, ooh, silly me, I thought that was a snake, it's only a stick, that's not a particularly serious mistake to make. Oh, look, it's only a harmless stick. Oh, shit, it's a snake. That's a pretty severe mistake to make. So it's not unreasonable, even if it's irrational, for our brain to contain this bias. So loss aversion, if you like, is irrational in economic terms, but you may say that in evolutionary terms, in terms of survival, actually preferring more modest gains with a lower chance of catastrophe hardly seems to be ridiculous. So I acknowledge that's only one example, but the use of the word rational is very dangerous. Economists use it um, in an unqualified sense, and that shouldn't happen. If you look at Gerd Gigerenzer's book, Gut Instinct, The Hidden Intelligence of the Unconscious, he creates the phrase, um, uh, the term, if you like, uh, ecologically rational, which is a sensible thing given the information you have to hand and the likely consequences of making a mistake. Thinking that a stick is a snake is almost certainly ecologically rational. Uh, other examples would be social rationality. Well, copying other people's behaviour is, in economic theory, rather silly. It's extraordinarily efficient if you're a herd species. Effectively, to some degree, copying other people's behaviour without really thinking about it sometimes gives you the benefit of having 200 pairs of eyes rather than just one. You can profit from other people's learning and experience very, very efficiently with far less effort than it would uh, require to learn skills from scratch. So that's ecological or social rationality. Uh, evolutionary theorists talk about deep rationality, many things that appear completely senseless um, if you look at purely first-order definitions of rationality, uh, religion and humour, for example, may have some extraordinarily valuable second- or third-order evolutionary function, which, just because we can't actually define it, describe it, or attach numerical values to it, doesn't mean it's not important.